everybody, and welcome to the show. I'm James, that's Katie, and of course, that makes this episode 46 of the Circles and Squares PlayStation podcast, and our final episode for 2021. Uh, New Year's is coming up quick again, Kate, and we're we're wrapping up the, the show here, or the year here, with one last show. It's our award show, of course, but um, before we get into any of that, welcome to the show one last time, and uh, yeah, happy, happy holidays, and Merry Christmas to everyone who celebrates. Um, hope you're all having a relaxing and safe holiday. Yeah, absolutely. Merry Christmas, everyone. Um, I guess we're recording this on Boxing Day, uh, if, if that's your preferred holiday schedule. So we're still in the Christmassy spirit. I ate way too much chocolate. I want to die. Um, <laughs> but other than that, it's been lovely. Um, James is in his holiday goth for anyone who uh, <laughs> isn't yeah, watching on I video I celebrate today. Christmas in black. Um, I, of course, been a little more festive. And I hate my webcam. I really need to. That's my 2020 two resolution is to like get a better setup because i always feel like i wear like cool relevant shirts and then you see like nothing so for anyone who can't see or like is just listening to video i've got this like really dope skyrim um holiday sweater and on the sleeves it's got like the um it's very the helmet. nice it's, it's, very it's super cool. cool um so just pretend to be impressed for uh for anyone who doesn't see it <laughs> Um, Kate, we got a lot to talk about today. Of course, it's the last show of the year, like we said. Um, again, thank you all for joining us for this great year of podcasting. Um, we, of course, have a show next week as well, which is the news report that usually comes out. I guess we'll just we'll just get over a bit of this housekeeping stuff now. Um, but because it's the new year and you know Christmas and all that stuff, it really doesn't seem like there's a lot of news that's going to come out in the gaming industry. So we're going to play it by ear. It may be a news show next week, or we may uh, do an episode of the bonus podcast instead. Um, finally get that that lost character ranking out so we'll play it by ear but you will see uh, you'll have to wait and see what you get on monday next week from us um but yeah you know so we have a lot to talk about today we're going to start off of course with the games we've been playing uh, and then for the second part of the show as we did last year at the end of the year it is time for the official second ever circles and squares award show uh, where we'll give out some awards for different games of different categories that we played throughout the year. And we have some listener submissions as well, which we're excited to read out and get some of those uh, community involvement uh, pieces in there as well, because we got some good lists some fun responses for sure. Mm -hmm. So we'll go through those um, a little bit later. Uh, but for now, Kate, why don't we talk about some games we've been playing, the last games we've played to talk about on the show this year. And I want you to tell me all about Death's Door, because this mm -hmm. game looks fantastic. This game is fantastic. Uh, it came out in 2021, so not only is it a game of the year contender for my 2021, but also 2021 in general. So um, it's a real treat. Uh, I remember this game being on all the like showcases of like E3s and, and like summer gaming fest and all, all that kind of stuff. And I, I made some list to myself or like miserable comments to myself from when I watch those. I make little notes so I remember things and. Um, the, the two ones I made for this show, because it was at a couple different showcases, and the two ones I had, I, I kind of, I picked them out where I'd written them down because they made me laugh. And the first one is Titan Souls, but this time you're a bird. Uh, and then the second one <laughs> is Top Down Isometric Action, and then in all caps, Bird Game. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I was excited about this one for good reasons. Uh, and you are indeed a bird. Um, the premise is you're like a reaper and you're, you're working for death and you have to go take the souls of big monsters who just are too stubborn to die. Um, and then from there, there's some mystery and intrigue added in, but, uh, the game is fantastic. If you haven't seen it, just look up a screenshot. Like it hooks you immediately with the charm. Uh, the world is beautiful. It's, it's adorable. The bird is fantastic. Uh, it's got great little like attention to detail and animation quirks everywhere. Like when you fall off a ledge, for example, you kind of flap your little wings a little bit to steady yourself. And there's just tons of, of wonderful little details. Like it's totally a passion project, this game. Um, the areas are colorful, the NPCs are hilarious. I can't spoil them because sometimes they end up being funny and sometimes they end up being like actually kind of very plot relevant <laughs> in weird ways. Um, yeah, but, yeah. But one you meet early is, is this one of my favorites. Uh, he's like this, this weird gardener guy and his head is just a pot full of soup. Um, and so he just has a bunch of dumb puns about how his head's full of soup. Uh, and it's Was this cuphead? <laughs> it's Cuphead. Yeah, it's kind of like Cuphead. He reminded me a lot of um, the, uh, oh, I'm blanking on the name, which is hella embarrassing for me. Um, Siegmeier, uh, the Katarina Bros from uh, from Dark Souls. He reminds me a lot of those guys. Um, the Onion Knights, but instead this is Pot Knight. Mm. 
Um, but anyway, there's it's just such a beautiful, charming game. Um, but once you've kind of been been drawn in and hooked by how gorgeous it is, uh, there's actually quite a lot of meat to the game, and not just in Pop Boy's uh, Pop Boy's head, um, and actually in the gameplay as well. Uh, so there's a there's a <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's kind of three parts I'd say there's the exploration um I played this with a friend and him and I 100 percented it uh we got you know the nice title screen we found every single collectible every single upgrade every single um little like charm and, and health thing that we could find so we we did the full gauntlet on this one um so that was really pleasant the world is just wonderful to explore and then we've got Sorry, I'm just moving my cat off my desk. Um, he's not allowed to podcast. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Welcome to the podcast, Neville. Welcome to the podcast, Neville. If you look in the background, he might uh, he might be walking around uh, causing trouble. Um, but anyway, so, yeah, exploration. And then we've got the, the third pillar of the game is the puzzle solving. So I would say it was really satisfying. It never really got to the point where we were stumped. Um, it's, it's more on the simple side. But it was very interactive and I think it did kind of steadily build on itself at, a, at the perfect pace. So even though we, we were never like really, you know, like solving super complex puzzles, they always felt really satisfying and they progressed really nicely. And with each kind of tool you got, it kind of altered how the puzzles could get solved. And so I think it wasn't just like, okay, there's this type of puzzle and now there's this next type of puzzle and, and it's just different things. They really kind of built on each other nicely with what resources you had available to yourself. Um, so I think that was yeah, just... I think that's the best way that puzzles get mm -hmm. get tackled in games too. And like that, the level of difficulty just seems like the the perfect sweet spot. Yeah. You know, like I don't like it when the puzzle gets so complicated that you kind of you sit there for that little bit too long and become frustrated, or you feel like, oh, maybe I'll just look this one up to get past it. Like it, it's nice when you have that, like you're just getting challenged enough and you're able to figure yeah. it out, but it's still like tender skills. Yeah, absolutely, and, and that's exactly what this was like. Like especially since like some of them required some quick timing. Or um, there, you know, because it's it's involving action, or there is that strategic like uh, like you're jumping over gaps and you're kind of having to time things with a lot of the puzzles. So you don't want it to be something you have to try 15 times because you know exactly what you need to do and it's just the execution. So it definitely had that perfect sweet spot for me of like it was difficult enough to be really engaging and, and fun and it felt satisfying to to pull it off, but it was never. It never killed the pacing of the game, which is quite a fast paced game um, because the third pillar is the action, which is fantastic. I absolutely adored this. The combat gets pretty intense, especially with a couple of the final bosses being um, a really good test of your skill, specifically the, the final final boss. Um, it is an amazing sequence and it kind of takes you through like some puzzle platforming sections in the middle of the boss fight and then you're fighting him and then it kind of you run through a gauntlet that's just genuinely like a victory lap of everything you've done in the game. Uh, and it, it absolutely astounded me. Um, but you, you've got a, a really simple system of dodging, light and heavy melee attacks uh, and then you have a spell button and you have four different spells that you can you can switch throughout the game uh, and all the spells are wonderfully designed they all have a puzzle solving mechanic but they also have a combat consideration uh, and I, I think it's it's designed beautifully uh, so it's simple but it, it's very elegant uh, I won't spoil them because you kind of you don't start out with the spells you kind of have to find them and then they're upgrades for mostly for like puzzle solving and interacting with the world but then they're fun to use in battle. So I won't spoil them, but I will tell you my favorite is a grapple uh, you get. And it's not really, you know, you see the grapple points pretty early on. You know exactly you're getting like a hook shot kind of thing. Um, so that lets you it's kind like of... It's like in Halo Infinite. It's the grapple exactly. shot or the grapple hook. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Which one? <laughs> uh, I call it the grapple, but, you know, that might be wrong. But um, so you, you can go to these specific points to help you traverse around the map. Um, but it also has the ability to use in combat. So if you grapple to an enemy, you fly towards them and you get invincibility mm -hmm. while you do it. So you can kind of dodge through attacks by grappling like through them to the enemy. And then you can also do like a specific like right. attack out of the grapple. And once we have that thing, which, which you get pretty late into the game, we spent the whole rest of the game just being like grapple shot, grapple shot, like dodging around in the middle of fights. And it was, it was so cool. Um, so I'm a big fan of that. And then the other thing in combat that I was really surprised by, which again is, is so simple, but so elegant. And I think that's kind of quintessential of the entire game is that the mana system is really clever. So you have 
I think you start out with four points of mana. Um, most spells take one. I think one spell takes two points of mana, so it's a little bit, a little bit heavier. Um, but what you have is to refill it once you use a slot, you have to melee attack something. So the spells can be pretty mm. powerful in combat because typically they're ranged attacks, which keeps you at a safe distance, um, and, and they can be very strong tools, but you can't abuse them without also going in and, and kind of fighting toe to toe. So you get in this really nice rhythm of like doing a couple hits, getting out, shooting some spells, going back in for a couple hits and like kind of weaving in and out and dancing with enemies. And I thought it, it was really unique because... Oftentimes in, in games like this, range stuff can kind of like be tough to balance. It can kind of trivialize some fights because it's designed with like, you know, they're just attacking in front of them and you're like halfway across the screen. And so even in like some of the behemoths, like Dark Souls can be really trivialized with magic and ranged abilities. It's just like a super strong tool. But I liked this idea of kind of like weaving in and out and the way it's intricate intricate oh that's a tough word to say it is <laughs> <laughs> it is an intricate system of um of balancing yeah. the two and it, you're balancing your resource and then you're using it and it feels so cool to kind of dodge out and then get a good shot and go back in so um yeah that's great because i know like a lot of games like you you can kind of find those, like you said, those kind of cheese strategies where like, wow, this is this is really strong and I'm just going to sit back at a range and like blast these guys away. So yeah. it's kind of nice that they make you engage in both types of combat to be able to actually use your skills. Like, I, I think that's really smart. Yeah, it is fantastic. And then it also has some kind of um, some puzzle solving uh, things to consider as well, because if you need to use a range something, I won't spoil what it is, but if you need to range something to maybe hit a switch across the room, well, you need a point of mana to be able to to shoot that. And so you need to make sure that like if you're fighting at the same time or if you're if you're doing like a, a series of of puzzles in a row that require all the right amount of shots, you need to make sure you have all that mana for you as well. So that kind of comes into puzzle solving as well as combat. Uh, and I think that's just the beautiful thing about this game. It's one of those amazing games that every aspect of it kind of works so well in tandem with each other. And I just think it, it's such a cohesive, beautiful package that there wasn't any element that kind of took you out of it or it wasn't like, oh, I'm at this section. Like, that's not as fun as doing the other section, but I guess I'll get through it. It was just perfect. And I, and the length, I think it was about 13 hours we beat it in, which is really like, it didn't overstay its welcome. And mm. I think it's, it's the nice, short, bite-sized kind of game to get through. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that actually too because I remember we were talking about Death's Door at one point on the show previously like when mm -hmm. it was being shown and I remember you specifically mentioning that you were put off by the shorter length of it. Like you yeah. felt like it may not have been worth it for the, the you know, minimal gameplay and I was like, oh, you know, you can't judge a game based on its price, you know, it could be yeah. worth it. And so I just want to <laughs> hopefully get you a bit of crow or something, you know, like can I earn some points on this one? <laughs> all right, all right, I, I concede. Um, maybe I said that, maybe I didn't. Uh, there's no proof out there on the internet anywhere. <laughs> um, but yeah, absolutely. I think what I heard about this game, and it's kind of a shame because it sort of came out and everyone was like, oh, it's like a, it's like a top-down Souls-like game. This is awesome. And it, the comparison is fair. Like it's got a really, it's got some difficult combat to it. It's, you know, it's got a dodge roll, which is very exciting, has, has some uh, iframes on certain things. And um, you, you know, you got a sword. So yeah, definitely some souls in there. Um, but I, I think it's disingenuous to say it's a souls game because it's very different than that. Um, and I think a lot of the negative reviews that, that happened when the game came out were people going with that expectation and then finding out that like, that's not really the case. Um, You're telling me the internet had incorrect expectations <laughs> for something and then didn't, decided they didn't like something because it wasn't exactly what they had predicted in their mind? Oh my God. Yeah, if, if, if you can believe that, just picture a world in your mind where that could exist and that's what happened. But everyone who actually kind of like ended up playing the game is nothing but good reviews. Like this game is, is wonderful. Like it deserved to win some game of the year stuff. Um, hint, hint for later. <laughs> we'll see. Um, <laughs> and I, I think it's just an absolute joy. Like not very often do I a hundred percent, hundred percent a game. And we went back yeah, right. like with all the upgrades and we're like, we're doing it. This is fantastic. So That's it awesome. was a joy to play. Um, I, I just want to shout out one other thing about the game and I don't want to spoil the story because I think it's actually, um, done quite well. Uh, but I, I really like the overall message of this. Um, you're a reaper, right? So it's all about death. Um, but the commentary on this game is the importance of death 
Uh, and it frames it as a positive thing in the sense of like, this is, this is the potential for how new life grows. And it's like a circle of life kind of thing. And, and death is like a celebration because it means that like, you're, you're moving on and, and you've given something and you've lived this beautiful life. And now in your death, there's a seed for something else to grow. And I, I just think that you don't expect that kind of a, a really strong commentary in a game that just looks really cute and charming and silly at first. And it, it balances mm -hmm. a lot of those serious tones, I think, really well with, with a lot of the lighthearted atmosphere. And I ended up, I really enjoyed it. Like there's a, there's a couple of characters that, that have some dialogue, especially near the end, that, that's kind of in that vein. And I just think that that's a really nice outlook to have on life. And uh, so not, not to get bo too bogged down in, in the serious and, you know, we don't have to have a whole <laughs> meta conversation about how great it is to die. But I just think that that's a much more positive and nicer outlook than like, you know, how, how negative it typically is in, especially in, you know, Western North America. Sure, culture. yeah. So, I think of course, yeah. It reminds me of when I played uh, Spirit Fair earlier in the year. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's been some games tackling this kind of, like, what happens when you die kind of topic, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, how does that affect, like, what, is, what does life mean? What are you trying to accomplish? Like, uh, it really takes, well, like, that makes me think of that instantly. Because that's, yeah. I mean, uh, Spirit Fair is a lot more overt <laughs> with what it's trying to do, for yeah. sure. But, I mean, similar idea. Yeah, I, th I think it's a really good comparison. And, and I think it's great. Like, it, it kind of hit me well as like an adult that's kind of, I've dealt with that in my life. But I, I think genuinely it's one of those things where like a young person playing this game who's never really like thought about that before or come into contact with some of these more serious themes. Like we take a lot of uh, inspiration and kind of how we, we contextualize things in our mind. A lot of it, like games and movies and books, like it seems kind of silly, but that is sometimes our first experience with some of these more serious or, or heavy topics in life. And I think this is just a really positive one that I, I think like a kid could kind of play this game. And it is definitely a game like a younger audience could enjoy. Um, it might be a little difficult in some areas, but I still think like, you know, like, you know, 12 year old kid, could, probably, 12 -year -kid yeah. could totally play this. Like they probably kick my ass at a lot of games. So yeah, 12 year olds definitely could play Death Store. Uh, and I think that might kind of resonate with them nicely as well. And um, yeah, I genuinely like have nothing but positive things to say, James, you, you got to play this one and it's on PS4 now, uh, or sorry, PS5. And it has like the dual sense controls, which I didn't get, uh, I'm very envious of. <laughs> and mm, so mm -hmm. oh, you played on PC. I played it on PC. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I do plan on playing this. I mean, it's, it's on the, we always say like, man, it's on the short list. There's like <laughs> 15 games on the short list, but I mean, death store is, is definitely one with all the awards and like hearing you talk about it and our good friend, Mike over at, yeah. um, twitch.tv, Mr. Del Monster, he, he played it really liked it. So. I mean, mm -hmm. you, I judge your guys' opinions. I, I hold them pretty highly. So, I mean, yeah, this is on the list. I'd, I'd like to play it for sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, looks cool. Looks cool. I'm excited to play that. Yeah. But for now, let me tell you about Gunman Clive, a game which I introduced you to this morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm glad um, you did. Uh, I looked it up and it looks yeah. cool. I, my first takeaway on this game is, and you're telling me if I'm correct, it looks like it's been made on post-it notes, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> It does look like it's made on post-it notes. It looks like, uh, yeah, the graphic style is very much like if you had some kind of like parchment paper or like sepia toned paper and you pretty much did like, you know, it's, it's very much like a sketch look style. If you, It's not like Cuphead. Obviously, it's nowhere near the quality of that, but it's got that same kind of idea of like the game is meant to look like like a pencil drawing or like you've colored it in on a piece of paper. And there's like really nice line work that happens in the background and kind of adds to the shading of the game. And it's it's very simplistic in its appearance, but it but it's um when you look at it and you play it long enough, you're watching it move, it actually you're like you're like very impressed by the the art style of it. I think it's got a really unique look. And it's really important to shout out too, like this is I actually played Gunman Clive one and two on the combo pack. They're both very short, like you can beat them both in an hour each. Like I th I think it maybe took me two and a half hours to get through both games. So I'm gonna talk about them as one. But um both games are made by one person. It's another one of these like Hollow Knight kind of stories, a guy named Bertel Horberg who is, uh, I actually found out about this game through the This Nintendo Life podcast. They're big uh, proponents of Gunman Clive. And so I found it on, it was on the Switch eShop for like literally $2. Mm -hmm. And I had those gold points where you, you know, yep. you get the points yep. for buying stuff. So I picked it up literally for free. And it's just this one guy that made it. And I mean, yeah, this, it, it really blew me away. I think, I think the first game is definitely a lot more simplistic. Um, it's a side-scrolling kind of action platformer. It's very similar to like uh, like an old-school Mega Man kind of game. You got the the jump and the gun, and that's all you got. Right. Or you know, like Mario, that kind of like right to left kind of or left to right kind of platforming. Mm -hmm. 
it's but it's just like the with the animation and the and the uh, the theming of it like you play as a cowboy gum and clive and so you're fighting against like other bandits and um for some reason the other enemy in the game is like ducks so you're fighting against bandits and ducks for most of the time uh <laughs> it's duck. quite quite interesting yeah um they they're just and it's eventually like the ducks are carrying the cowboys in the air like it's you know they kind of combine you're really it really makes you question like what am i trying to do the whole premise is like at the start of the game it just shows you one cut scene where i think like the the sheriff's daughter or something gets kidnapped and you got to go save her like the story is really inconsequential but it's just a it's just a fun time of like nice bite-sized chunks like the game kind of checkpoints you really nicely um, none of the levels are more than like one minute long and a lot of them are designed like really uh I, I think this game is really meant for speed running actually okay. like it's the kind of game where a lot of the levels you can kind of just hold right and as long as you time your jumps and your gunshots correctly you don't really have to stop running so okay. you can kind of like you know really string together some nice runs and a few levels like they have some of those kind of surprise like oh this guy popped out of nowhere and shot you in the head so you're right. dead but now on the next time through you know he's going to do that so you can quickly like duck and shoot him or whatever right so it's meant to and be a so, little trial by error kind of thing exactly i mean you can see some of it coming but other times it's like okay now i know this is coming and then you you know you beat the level in 30 seconds and you didn't stop running forward and it actually yeah. feels like you've you've uh like wow i feel pretty impressed that i was able to do that so quick um, and so the, the first game is pretty basic. I mean, you're running along. Um, there's a couple different gun upgrades you can get. You can have like spread shot or like a, like a power shot kind of thing. And the levels are pretty much just different, different like jumping obstacles type of thing. And then there's bosses at the end. So you're fighting like um, robots and di just different kind of, you know, it gets pretty zany sometimes. But the, the idea is just to always have a weak spot. You're going to shoot them a few times. Um, kind of like Mega Man. It's, it's a really good comparison. Yeah. That sounds like Mega Man, but maybe like opposite in the way of like this seems like kind of a fun game just pick up for an hour and kind of like hang relax with for an evening whereas Mega Man is like bone chilling yeah, difficult yeah. and like there's nothing relaxing about playing some Mega Man that's true that's true maybe the the key comparison is the game plays like Mega Man but it's a hell of a lot easier yeah, like yeah. I, I really didn't struggle too much Gunman Clive 2 um to get into that one a little bit more because there's a lot more meat on the bone for number two Mm -hmm. um, obviously, like I said, these games are like two bucks. Like it really isn't a huge amount of substance. But um, so the second one, you can really tell though, like they really stepped it up. Um, the second one has the same art style, except now the paid, there's different levels that have different colors. So it's not always that brown kind of sepia. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, you know, some levels are green or purple or wherever yeah. you are. And, well, you, and the, you can buy the those setting... different post-it notes now, right? Like sometimes you can find those different <laughs> colored ones. So I actually have for video listeners, I've got ah! a post-it note cube here. <laughs> Uh, which is kind of cool, actually. Yeah. All right, you can you um, can make Postman, Clive. <laughs> yeah, trust game. me, I do a lot of Post-it note work, as you can see by my wall over here. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, um, so yeah, you just get there's a lot more colors that come in. There's a lot of different environments. Like the first one's very Wild West focused, but in the second game, it's like all of a sudden you're in a prehistoric world and there's a T-Rex chasing you, or you're in like an airship or a factory. Like it gets really out there in terms of where you go. And I think it was almost like the first game sold pretty well. And obviously with a with a one man development team, you know, it's at least there's probably not a lot of cost in terms of like paying your employees and stuff. So I guess he was Bertle, our man Bertle was able to save up a bit of extra cash and really go all out for the second game. Um, and the second game also is is pretty cool. Like it's the same kind of bite sized level idea, but what's really neat is they he expands it into a few different types of levels. So along with the side scrolling levels now, there's also like these sections where you're riding on an animal. Like one level you're riding on a panda and nice. you can't make it stop. Like a crash, so it really does like a become, crash bandicoot kind of thing. Kind of, yeah, yeah, kind of. But it's but it's still le side scrolling, yeah, so right. you're you're not like going forward. But there are actually um, as well like some 3D kind of forward mm -hmm. on perspective levels because similar to like old school like Star Fox type of graphics okay. yeah um, you're kind of going forward as you're riding a pterodactyl and there's another one where you're like on a horse going down a path and just that little bit of variety is super nice and I, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it to break the game up a little bit um, and as well like it just still adds to that speed of like you can't stop those levels either so you're always just kind of it's a lot about dodging is just as much as it is about shooting on those as well which is really cool and the game also has like some really nice consistency in terms of the levels are crazy but like you'll be you know jumping along the outside of an airship and then you'll the level will finish you'll be at the door and the next level you're inside the airship so it's okay. like 
you mm-hmm. continue on this adventure. And the third game also has um, three playable characters as well, which is kind of cool. You can play as um, Gunman Clive, or there's like a guy with a spear you can throw, or like uh, I think the other one maybe is the princess from the first game, or like the okay. the girl you rescue. So I, I didn't actually check those out, but there is like other characters, which I guess would give you more ways you could complete the levels, I guess, hypothetically. Um, there's the other game, the second game still has ducks and cowboys and all that funny right. stuff. And I just have to shout out, like, I am going to spoil the end of the game here. <laughs> Number two, like, it's, it's who cares, right? It's Gunman <laughs> Clive. But what I like about this, so the premise of the second game, the first game, you're rescuing the princess. The second game, you're like, going to take down the group of bandits that kidnapped her originally. So you're okay. like, killing all these right. cowboys. Gunman Clive and revenge. for some reason... Yeah. Gunman Clive's getting his revenge. Yeah. The ducks are still present. Like, you know, yeah. what's going on with that? You get to the final boss, and the final boss is actually cool. It's kind of like a reference to um, Shadow of the Colossus or like one of those games. Mm-hmm. You're actually kind of like climbing up and breaking different parts off of a boss, but it's still in a 2D setting. So, and there's yeah. ladders and stuff. Like, it's kind of neat. That's but you get up to the head, you're like breaking his legs, you're breaking his chest so you can climb these platforms. You get up to the head. And you finally kill the head, and inside the cockpit of this robot, it's a the duck. duck. Yes, it's, <laughs> it's a, a duck. duck. <laughs> and a, the duck falls to the ground. Gum and Clive falls to the ground, and then it's just you versus this duck. And I'm sure you could die to it because that it's like not an easy fight at the end, and so you could be like pretty low on health. And if you touch the duck, you die. But luckily, I managed to crouch. I shot the duck once; it died, and the game is immediately like congratulations you beat the game like it's just <laughs> over like in a snap and it's like before you even know what happened it's just done and that's i'm like awesome. okay i guess the ducks were the leaders of the bandit group after all and thank you gunman clive you saved the day uh, <laughs> that sounds awesome that sounds like the perfect kind of like two dollar like you just want to like try something different for an evening like that sounds like such a fun time 100 percent that's exactly what I thought, right? I mean, there's been so many sales going on with like Boxing Day and Black Friday and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Just on the eShop and I just kind of came by it and it was on one of those like, you know, 90% off like like bargain basement price. And I'm, you know, like, mm-hmm. oh, the guys in this Nintendo Life were talking about this, you know. Um, for anyone who hasn't listened, check out their show, by the way. It's mm-hmm. uh, one of the heavy inspirations for ours. But uh, anyway, yeah, I, I, I'm really glad I played it. If anyone has some extra Nintendo points chilling around, like I think this was originally on 3DS, so it's it's not an old game. Um, I mean, it's not a new game by any stretch of the imagination, but for an afternoon, if you've got something to do or like if your family wants to watch a movie that you don't like or something, just <laughs> just uh, <laughs> buy Gum and Clive on your Switch and, That's, and you're going to have a good time. That is the funniest thing you said because genuinely, like since I've lived alone, I have played my Switch so much less frequently because it was always my go-to like person i live with wanted to watch a movie or a show i'm not really into yeah. like it's switch time we can sit on the couch together and like i'm gonna run through like some fire emblem or whatever the heck it was <laughs> <And> like, <laughs> yeah yes i need it to works, i just need someone come over or i'll go to someone else's house and like i'll bring my switch gunman clive time like please put on something you, shit you just, gotta, <laughs> just pull your friends of who's gonna watch the worst movie or n- worst tv show in the next two weeks and just you know check out who it is and then that's right, <laughs> make yeah. some plans that's right oh oh you're watching uh, some sci-fi space show like oh can i oh. come over <laughs> entertainment tonight hey oh okay all right oh i don't have any friends that bad come on Um, oh man okay well i think that's going to do us for the games we've been playing because we have a big ass award show to get to so let's get right into it kate um for those of you that were not listening last year i strongly encourage you to go back i think it was episode episode 20 20. last year episode 20 episode 20 that was our award show uh, we like to make the end of every year uh, the Circles and Squares Awards, where we get like to give out a bunch of different awards, um, which Kate will tell you now. Yeah, absolutely. So these are awards from last year. Um, I kind of guess we'll run through them quickly if you want more, um, you know, something really catchy around like, why did you give that award? You're going to have to go check out episode 20 when we break it down a little more. Um, but these are our categories uh, for last year. We start out with the most surprising game. Uh, which was a game that was either far better, far worse, or far stranger than our initial expectations. Uh, And James gave this to our our resident um, mascot, Astro's Playroom. Uh, Because I guess we'd just gotten our PS5s. Um, I think we did, yeah. We just gotten them. We would have just gotten them, yeah. It would have been last fall. Yeah, Yeah. it would have been last fall. And and so I give it to Ghost of Tsushima, uh, which I think we'll we'll see a couple more times uh, (laughs) in this list. Um, and then moving on, we had our best co-op game, uh, which was the best jolly cooperation, either couch or online. Uh, and James gave this to Ghost of Tsushima because this would have been right when the multiplayer dropped, uh, which was right that- when we got into Legends. Yeah, yeah, right into Legends, which we really both enjoyed, I think. Uh, and I gave it to Divinity Original Sin 2, which was my behemoth of 2020. 
Um, then we had, so this next category is that we gave it to the funniest game, uh, which is the game that demonstrates the highest level of comedic genius. Uh, and so this year we've actually swapped that out for a fun new category that maybe I'll save as a surprise. It's a spoiler, yeah. Mark. Or um, not spoiler. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you gave it to South Park Fractured But Whole, and I gave it to Danganronpa 2. Uh, shout outs to our favorite fat character on that one, uh, which I can't spoil, but holy shit, that I might be it, the funniest yeah, thing that's ever right, happened right, right. in a video game. Um, and then we had our best PS Plus, uh, which is the best offering available on, on PS Plus that we got throughout the year. You gave it to Hollow Knight, which is 100% the correct answer. Um, and I was so proud of you. I, I gave it to Erica, which was kind of neat. Uh, that like FMV game. I think Erica was a good choice, honestly. Erica yeah. was a, was good a choice. ton of fun. I think Erica also like encompasses what PS Plus is. Mm-hmm. Like a cool game that you'd want to play, but wouldn't necessarily love to go and buy. Yeah, you know? I agreed. It was one of those ones where like, I'm so glad I had it. And it was like a fun evening, but like, yeah, I would never have even known it existed otherwise. Um, so that was a blast. Uh, and then we move on. We've got our best comfort food game, which is the perfect game to curl up and relax with. Uh, and you gave it to, which I think is the quintessential comfort food game, which is Slay the Spire. Um, I think you played it in 2020. I played it in, I played it earlier and somehow. Oh, I've I played it every year since I've played it yeah, the first time. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, I know. It's like, it's like an absolute addiction, that game. It, I think it might be genuinely bad for my health, but it is a good game. Um, and I give it to Heroes of the Storm, which is kind of a funny pick for that category. Um, but it was just kind of like our go-to like hangout game. So, mm-hmm. um, and then our second last category we have was the best new mechanic. So this is the best new or unique use of a mechanic in game. Uh, and you gave it to, I think a really cool answer was your Star Wars squadrons with the ship controls. Uh, yeah. Really impressed you. I, I remember qualifying that by being like, you know, I don't play any of these games, so these very well might not be that unique. But for mm-hmm. me, it was like very cool to to see that. So, yeah. And that's awesome because, again, it's not the list of the year. It's a list of our experience with the year, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So if we played a game from, like, the 90s, it still counts. It's on the list. <laughs> um, and I gave it, of course, to Demon Souls with the invasion mechanics, the note system, uh, the shadows, because, obviously, Demon Souls being a, a new game in 2020, it was originally a PS3 game and, and did a lot of really cool things that uh, From is now known for. So we shouted out that. I think we shouted out as well God of War's camera because, like, that was fucking cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then finally, we had our game of the year, which is the game your brain will just not shut up about. Uh, and to no one's surprise, James had Persona 5 The Royal. Uh, and I think you declared it the best game you've ever played in full stop. Still is, baby. It still is, baby. <laughs> still it's the is, best game so. in the world. Uh, so we'll see uh, if that ever changes. Maybe Persona 6 uh, one, one day will finally get announced. We'll see. We'll uh, see. And I had a toss-up. I think we everyone expected it to go to Demon Souls. Uh, but actually, I went with Divinity Original Sin 2, which still to this day is contention for best game I've ever played. Um, man. Okay, yeah. I'm not. I can't. I can't what go into list? Divinity. <laughs> Watch the old yeah, episodes. Yeah. Um, it, we, yeah. have, we have a lot to get. Through we got a lot sure, to get so. through. Um, but anyway, yeah, we we sent this list out, and some we had some lovely people reply on Twitter with a couple of their. Uh, yeah, it was great. Game of the year. So maybe maybe read us through it. Um, it was great. Yeah, we had some responses. So just I want to. We're gonna go through the list here. So we they will be figuring out what the new uh, the new category we put in. So we replaced right. the the funny game this year. Um, humor in games is just tough and it's, you know, it's hard to convey that sometimes. So we mm-hmm. thought it'd be better, uh, to throw in a category, which is, uh, the best backlock game. So a game we've been meaning to play for a while and finally got around to that we enjoyed. So, uh, just some community responses before we get into our, uh, our own list. Again, thank you all for everyone that wrote in. We'd love to hear from everybody. And if you want to get in touch with us in the future for anything, uh, you can get in touch over at, uh, at CNS pod on Twitter. Um, the links are all below, or you can email us at circlesandsquarespod at gmail.com. Um, either way is great. We'll get to your submissions and we'll read them out and answer your questions, all that good stuff on the show. Um, but for our list this year, we have a few responses. The first one is from our good friend, again, Mr. Del Monster, and he writes in comfort food game of the year, Rocket League, surprising game, Genshin Impact. Yeah. Uh, co-op, best co-op game, Apex Legends. I think because he plays best with you, PS right? <laughs> he plays with me, yeah, yeah. he plays with me. Um, best PS Plus game, Final Fantasy VII Remake. 
Uh, best new mechanic is Mortal Shell. He didn't write what the mechanic in Mortal Shell is, but might maybe, be the shells. Uh, might be the shells. Probably the shells. <laughs> yeah, probably the shells. Yeah. Uh, best backlog game is Cuphead, and finally, uh, Mike's game of the year is Hades, with Death Door being a very close second. That is, um, and it's just a very it's it's an important thing to qualify. I think you said it just before K two, but our lists are not restricted to games that came out this year. It could be anything that you have played this year. So yeah. uh, great list. Uh, any any other things stand out for you there? I mean, that's a money list. I'm. I'm very excited for Mortal Shell. Um, that was the PS Plus for this month. I haven't gone around to starting it yet, but I'm, I'm very excited about it. So I'm glad to see it getting some uh, some shout outs here. And of course, um, Hades being game of the year, totally deserved. Death Door, very close second. If, if I had to, if I was Mike, I think I'd do it the same way, but I'm glad he shouted out both of those amazing indie games. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Mike, I totally agree with you uh, for Rocket League being comfort food. I wasn't my answer for this year, but uh, man, shout out to that. Uh, our next submission was from our good friend Nick at Loud Thumbs, or at least I assume it's Nick, uh, posting under the Loud Thumbs Twitter account. Um, but com for comfort food, he wrote down Halo. Yeah, that's definitely Nick. Uh, which again Nick. makes me think it's Nick. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely Nick. Um, most surprising game, It Takes Two, as well as the best co-op game being It Takes Two. Um, he has best PS Plus game being Kings of, Kings of Amalur. Uh, best new mechanic is the grapple shot in Halo. Make sure to say the grapple shot, not the grapple hook. Uh, best backlog game is Shadow of War. And favorite game of the year, he said he can't spoil, but please check out the Loud Thumbs Game of the Year show in 2022. So we will do that. Uh, thanks for the list, Nick. And I agree, I've uh, been very blown away with It Takes Two, but I won't say any more on that because it may show up in my Game of the Year list in a few minutes. <laughs> Um, we have one more submission of the full list uh, by my good friend Klein over on Twitter as well. Um, he submitted the best comfort food game, Halo Infinite, uh, same as Nick. Uh, most surprising game, Death's Door. Best co-op game, It Takes Two. Best PS Plus game, Final Fantasy VII. Remake, I'm assuming, not the original. Uh, best new mechanics is the Portals and Splitgate. And the best backlog game, Breath of the Wild. So yeah, Breath of the Wild, a good call for a backlog game. Hey, Kate, we have not uh, really talked about that too much aside from when you played. Yeah, that, that's true. I might uh, have to follow up on that. I'm still kind of going through it, little bits and pieces here with a friend. But again, this is this is a money list. I'm surprised to see Halo be comfort food. I guess because Halo is just such a franchise people are familiar with and it's just so nice to be back in so, Halo. Yeah. But it's kind of a funny pick because it's, it's a very fast paced, hectic game to, to be relaxing with. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, but similar to your hots, you know, like if you're really yeah. into that realm, I guess it's, I guess yeah. it's just right what, what is, you want, right? What you feel like. That is totally true. But uh, yeah, and we have one final submission from the Plastic Hearts podcast who wrote in just for the game of the year part of the question, but uh, their game of the year is It Takes Two with a big nod to Forza 5 and Halo. And also they spent a bunch of time playing Breath of the Wild, such an amazing game. So uh, another Breath of the Wild shout out there. And some more love for It Takes Two. And man, I'm, I'm getting uh, increasingly embarrassed that I've not played Forza at this point <laughs> for, for having a game pass. You know, like it seems like that game is really getting a lot of a lot of love. So maybe I'll have to go back to that next year. Anyways, yeah, thank you again for all the responses, everybody. Love to see those. And without further ado, we're going to get into our answers for the awards this year. Uh, Kate, kick it off. All right, well, as, as our favorite Persona singer likes to sing, you'll never see it coming. <laughs> and we're going to go with our most surprising game. Again, this is a game that was either far better, far worse, or far stranger than we initially expected. Um, James, hit me up. What do you got? Yeah, so this one was interesting and tough to think of. I, I don't like to be overly negative. So uh, one game I did consider here for most surprising was 12 Minutes. Oh, um, you were I know a lot so of people looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. So much looking forward to that. And I, you know, I, we never ended up did, uh, getting around to the spoiler cast for that game, but I, there's a lot to say on it. And I, I just was really disappointed with kind of how it made me feel story wise. Um, so mm -hmm. I didn't, I just want to shout that out as another example. And, I, and one interesting one we haven't really talked about too much again is the Disco Elysium, which we both started mm -hmm. and we're very excited for and have kind of fallen off too. So I think maybe we've, we should have a discussion on that later. <laughs> but the, the answer that I really want to put out there is something that blew me away that I wasn't expecting in a good way was um, Streets of Rage 4 okay. earlier when I played it a few weeks ago. And I think I said it on that show, but I just, the beat em up that kind of, that type of games style is just not very prevalent these days like they it's really a you know a an archaic genre in a lot of ways like they don't really make those type of games a lot anymore the only one i've played really in a modern sense is um aside from this is river city girls which mm -hmm. is the sequel to like river city ransom and that game really like it was fun like the, the combat was fun but my problem was like 
you'd be it's it was a bit of more of an open world setup so you'd be constantly backtracking and enemies would respawn and it was it was just kind of tedious to get through that game and and streets of rage 4 really fixed that by having it was level based so you're always just progressing instead of walking around like an open world Mm -hmm. and so it took away kind of having to beat up the same guys over and over again just to get from point a to point b and instead you're just focused on beating the level which i really liked um, I love how the game encouraged you to use your special abilities by, you know, uh, incentivizing you to use like your full. It's similar to what you were saying with um, your game earlier, Death, Death Store, Store, like how they yeah. want you to use use your different abilities to build up your meters. Like this game also encourages you to use your full arsenal of, of moves based on like how they, they, the mechanics work and all that. So it was just a really great time. And um, I mean, we shouted out the the soundtrack as well on the on the episode when I talked about oh, this game. Like, man, was this so game. Good. <laughs> Yeah, if yeah. we had an award for soundtrack of yeah. the year, I mean, I would be, be nominating uh, this game right up there along with like the Artful Escape and, and other games with with great soundtracks. But um, Streets of Rage Four, I mean, yeah, if, if you're if you've never really played a beat 'em up game, but you're you're interested in checking one out and you want something that feels really modern and has a lot of you know difficulty tweaks you can make or like choose how many lives you have and and a v- good variety of characters with some fun moves, they all feel fun to play. I would definitely recommend this to people. Um, it's it's a nice taste, you know, and you might find a new genre. Like it's always nice. Like one of my favorite things about doing the podcast is playing games I wouldn't normally play mm-hmm. and checking out different stuff. And so this this really was that for me. And for that reason, I think it's my most surprising game of 2021. That's a really good answer. And I'm surprised I did not expect a game like Street of Rage to show up here. But you're totally right. That genre is just kind of disappearing. And maybe it'll get a resurgence. Like I know people are excited for the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which is kind of like one of the behemoths yeah. uh, for beat 'em up so. Man, I'm excited for that after <laughs> playing this. If it's yeah. done well, like if it was to come to Game Pass or be on a good sale one time, like I would for sure check that out after playing this, as long as it's done the right way. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that, that is a cool answer. Um, I'm going to ask you to actually guess what you think mine is because uh, <laughs> oh man, you're, you're uh, going to know. You, I think you won't guess it, but the second I say it, you're like, oh, of course, of course, that's what you picked. Yeah, I don't really, I don't really have too much of a guess. I was okay. gonna, uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna reserve my guess only because I, the only thing I can think of might be a spoiler for one of the other categories, and I really don't okay. want to uh, ruin that. So right. please just tell me. Fair enough. Uh, I, we'll I picked a Plague Tale Innocence. Oh, nice. Okay. (laughs) I didn't know. I didn't expect that to be surprising. I thought that might have shown up for a mechanic for you. Ah, okay. Okay. Because yeah, we we both played this game. Uh, It was one of our PS Plus games. We both picked it up. We both actually beat it, which is unusual for us on the PS Plus selections. And, you know, we we both kind of had, we weren't super impressed starting out. I think we both had a lot of like criticisms of the game and we, we kind of had a bit of, you know, some reservations when we were first playing. But I was thinking about it the other day, and especially once we saw the um, announcement of two at the uh, at Jeff's Game Awards, and I am so the excited Jeff Game Awards. at the Jeff Game Awards, yeah, the official Jeff Game Awards TM, um, and and he showed us off uh, Plague Tale Two, and oh my god, like I am so excited for that game, and it just made me even like, realize like how much I care about the characters in a Plague Tale, like how much I fell in love with like Amicia and Hugo, and they just really struck an emotional chord with me and the game is not perfect it, it's got some janky bits it, it could use a little bit of polishing here and there but the more I played that game the more I came to absolutely fall in love with it and I think it has it has a lot going for it the story the writing is is amazing the world is is phenomenal it's dark they didn't shy away from showing how the decaying of the world, the abundance of death. Like there are scenes in in that game where you're kind of walking through corpse piles and like they will stick with me. I've never seen another game tackle it in in that kind of like visceral, like real way. And the more I played that game and the more I thought about it afterwards, it just kept going higher and higher on my list of games that like, now I recommend this to everybody. I think it's, it's absolutely like a masterpiece. And it's just kind of funny because when you, when I first started playing, I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to love this. Like, it's okay. The gameplay's a little janky. And and it's just, it, it shocked me, especially afterwards, just thinking about how much this game actually, like, emotionally meant to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, like, mm-hmm. how much it yeah, stuck right. with me. And and so I think if anyone is hasn't played Plague Tale or, like, if you played the first hour and you're like, I'm not sure how fun this is going to be, like, stick with it. It is so incredibly worth it. And I'm so glad that we played it for the show because... I probably wouldn't have finished it or beaten it otherwise, but there was always that like, 
you know, that, that hook of like, well, what's going to happen next? Like what's going to happen with Hugo? Mm-hmm, and like, mm-hmm. it kept me going and kept me rolling on it. And, and also because we were playing it together and our friend Nick over at Loud Thumbs was playing it too. And, you know, we were all kind of chatting about it. And so that, that community aspect helped as well. And like, it's genuinely like one of the best games. I, I didn't pick it for my game of the year, but it is genuinely like up there in terms of like, in contention and mm. oh man it's so good <laughs> well, i'm glad you liked it that much yeah. i know like we won't get into it now like you're definitely hotter on it than me but one thing we mm-hmm. i think we can both agree on is that the game definitely has like an upward trajectory like it gets a lot better as you get into it than when it starts out and so mm-hmm. i think that's for sure uh yeah that's a good answer i'm, I'm so glad you enjoyed that <laughs> game that much and me too. Very excited. Um, the sequel looks great, but yeah. especially for you. The sequel looks yeah. great. Um, yeah, that's awesome. So we, we didn't play this game co-op, but kind of because we played it at the same time. Um, but our <laughs> next award is our best co-op game for the best jolly cooperation, either couch or online. Uh, and I'm going to take this one first because I think uh, these we might do. actually work nice sequentially. <laughs> I have a, sure, I have a yeah. very good I guess. I have a feeling they will. I have a feeling they will um, because I started a way out uh, and I haven't spoke about it on the show yet because uh, I'm... I'm assuming I'm almost done. I haven't actually beaten it yet. I think we played about three hours in one sitting and uh, we, we've escaped long ago. You're getting And there. we're on to other there. things now. So I think one more session, um, playing with my best friend, actually the, the guy we played Death Door with. So we're kind of, you know, running through some, we always have a game going and it's awesome. And we played a way out and I, I know this game's a little bit older now. Uh, and I know It Takes Two is, is the new hotness that kind of builds on everything that this game did. Um, but A Way Out is, is still so worth playing in 2021. Uh, it is so cool what Joseph Ferris, you know, how his mind works and how he put this game together where you've got both sides of the screen, you've got your own camera, and sometimes you're working together uh, and sometimes you're doing completely different things, but you'll see the other person in the background, whatever they're doing. Like the initial shot is so awesome where I'm, I'm playing... Um, as the guy who's been in prison for a little bit. And uh, yeah, I forget their names yeah, now. I forget their names. And, and Matthias is playing the guy who just got into prison. So while well, he's like getting off the bus and going in and getting like checked in and, you know, getting a shower in his new, his nice new outfit. Um, I'm, you know, hanging out with my buddies. Well, not really buddies. He's kind of really friends, but he's hanging out with the people outside and I'm in the yard and, you know, like working out a little bit, but I'm, I'm watching Matthias like come in and doing all his stuff and he's looking up at me and I'm like doing stupid things up against the fence. <laughs> and like, it, <laughs> yeah. it is a really, really well told story. It really makes you work together, uh, in, in ways that a lot of co-op games just don't. And I know we, we played a lot of games like, um, the We Were Here series and we played that. Yeah, Project um, Tang- Operation Project, Tango. Operation Tango. Yeah. And so these, it's kind of kicked off this, this new style of multiplayer where it's a lot of like things that you, you've each got your own job and you have to do it together, um, in order to solve the puzzles. But it, it's so much nicer than just like, you know, I would say like Portal 2 has an amazing co-op. It's amazing. I love Portal 2. But a lot of times it's just one person figures out the solution. I'm like, oh, do this. And then you do it and you're done. Whereas Mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. in games like this, like you really are working in tandem, but it's not ever up to one person to to kind of pull the weight of the party. Um, And so I love it. And and the other thing this game's got going for it is it's kind of got a serious story, but it's also goofy as hell. And we weren't expecting that. Um, But the amount of times that like, you know, at one point we got to play that band section and then we, we did like the yeah, horseshoe yeah, challenge yeah. and actually like counts like who's winning all these these silly little like games that you do as you go along. And I just think that's such a, a fun thing to, to get stupidly competitive over and it just adds so much to the game. So, um, yeah, Absolutely. It, it takes two yeah. is, is where you start um, and then, you know, you played that with your friend. OK, it was really fun. That was six hours. You need something new. James, what are we playing next? <laughs> <laughs> well, you said it takes two, and I think you meant a way out, but I will tell yes. you what it takes mm-hmm. two, because that is my co-op game. Um, I just want to quickly yeah. back up, though, before I get into it. An- another one to shout out along with those uh, other co-op games we played, because you and I have done a lot of co-op this year. Mm-hmm. We also played the original Gears of War, which I almost oh, put yeah. as my answer that for this. Fun. We had a lot of fun with that. But mm-hmm. I think what, what puts It Takes Two and for you a way out above Gears of War is similar to like when one person can kind of figure out the puzzle in, in one of those puzzle-based ones. In Gears of War, it's like you are working together, but really you're just trying to kill guys as much as you can. And it's, it's not really like you don't get that teamwork aspect in a lot mm-hmm. of the way you do. Like, sure, there's sometimes where you split up and it is helpful that like you're killing guys that you can see on my path and all that. But most of the time, it, you're just kind of shooting together and it could just be an NPC. But uh, shout out to Gears of War. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, good call. Um, but yeah, it takes two. It takes two has a lot of um, 
um, a way out DNA and it obviously being from Joseph as well. But I mean, just the, what you were saying about how um, there's th that level of like you're working together, but there's also the competitiveness. Like there's those types of mini games and it takes two as well. You can play like, you know, um, oh, what is it? Whack-a-mole where like one person goes in the box and you are the mole and you're choosing which <laughs> holes to pop out of and the other person has a hammer and you're trying to like see who can who can like avoid or hit the most. Like it's, it's just so stuff like that that, yeah, they break up the levels. Um, one thing I, I think it takes to actually does not do as well as the as a way out is... Um, a way out has like those one person cutscenes where like yeah the one person's entering the jail and you can kind of fuck around in the background or mm -hmm. or like just do your own thing, and that doesn't happen quite so much and it takes two like the cutscenes are more centralized and like you're both watching them together, but what you said about the the mechanics and stuff is so bang on like it takes two was just such a good time in terms of the way that it makes you work together and actually overcome things together. Like there's, there's so many different mechanics you get, obviously I'm, I didn't talk about them all before, but one of my, one of the, the best examples I think is like one of you gets um, the ability to shoot like nails or something into a wall and the other person's literally a hammer and you can, you can like swing on the nails with a little like nail remover on the back mm -hmm. of the hammer. So one person's like shooting nails into a wall to make a path and the other person's like swinging and platforming up the wall. And like, that's, that's just so integral for both people to be on their mm -hmm. game. And there's even boss fights where you're asymmetrically, um, there's one where it's like a bullet hell. Like I was outside just trying to dodge this spaceship and like, you know stay alive and then ash who i played it with um she was inside and she she was like in the ship and like trying to take it apart from the inside and we were we were both doing completely different things but it was that teamwork aspect and then there's also a ton of different puzzles which are you know platforming and based on you working together it was just a great time and i think that um the secret sauce that that haze light and joseph's able to put into these games of like couch co-op being so special in a in a time where everything is just online co-op and you're you know on discord and stuff it's just it can't be understated especially since these games like they have to be played with two people mm -hmm. and sure you can do them online but but it's something about sitting on the couch together is super special um it takes two i just want to also shout out for being such a um an easy game to pick up and play like obviously i play a lot of games being on the podcast but my my partner ash she doesn't play very many games at all and so her like she was a bit intimidated to come in and play with me but um, the game does such a good job of having an amazing camera like that. I don't know if I've ever seen a third person um, platformer have such an amazing camera where it, it you pretty much don't even have to touch it if you don't want to. Like it will show you where you need to go for the most part. And just that ability to make it easier for players who could struggle with like the two stick kind of setup. It was fantastic. And I would recommend it to anybody. Um, not personally my game of the year. I, I didn't vote it for that. But man, co-op game, it takes the cake like with a bullet, like easily. It takes two. It takes two. Oh, I'm so excited. That that was my one snipe. I thought maybe you had it for game of the year as well. So now I'm I'm reevaluating yeah. what I uh, what I got to assume here. Um, but I've got I got time. I'm gonna think about it because we got a couple other good categories to go through. Um, we'll go through one of my personal favorites on here that we do is the best PS Plus game, uh, and this is the best mm -hmm. offering available on PS Plus. Um, and I, I think last year we picked like games we actually played, and so that's why you got Hollow Knight and I didn't, is because I hadn't. You know, obviously Hollow Knight's one of my favorite games of all time, but I didn't play it in 2020 and I didn't play it for our PS Plus. So I think we've got that a little bit of that restriction going on. Um, Ooh, I don't know about that this year for me. Okay. I forgot. <laughs> I've absolutely lied. Uh, I, I just said something that was completely it's okay. fake. It's okay. <laughs> so, um, James, 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, fix your yeah. answer and go. <laughs> okay. Oh, man, I'm not going to fix it. I'm just going to go for it. Look, we didn't put this restriction on, but no. I just want another I made, opportunity I made to shout out myself. here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake was on yeah. PS Plus this year. And I know a couple of our uh, writer submissions or our audience submitted that as well. But I mean, I was looking through the list earlier and I actually have a um, other PS Plus game making an appearance on my list in a different category. So I'm going to leave that um, out for now. But because of that, I felt fine putting Final Fantasy VII Remake in here. I just want to give that game some more love, man. Like I really enjoyed that game when I played it especially as someone that had never played the original Final Fantasy VII, but it's given me interest to go back and actually try that out. I, I love how it's been modernized with kind of the the uh, 
I mean, it's, and it's an action game now, but it does have some sort of turn-based qualities in terms of how you pick your moves and how you control your partners and all that. But I, I really just think that world was so well crafted, and the, I mean, the the glow up in terms of the the visuals and everything that has been given are just obviously <laughs> miles ahead of the, the PS One game. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I think that specifically what really drew me towards that game, and I, w- I won't spoil it here, obviously, but um, just the way that they kind of ended and how they set up for what this kind of series is going to be in terms of um you know the future iterations of this obviously isn't the full story of final fantasy 7 but um i'm really interested to see where that goes in terms of um any of the changes they made i think it's just a fantastic remake and and um everyone should check it out because i absolutely loved it and mm-hmm. cloud sword is really cool looking they didn't lie to you and all those uh game facts polls in the early 2000s so he's a cool <laughs> character <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake is great, and you should all play it. Yeah, that, that is a good call. I, I did actually check that out for PS Plus. That was one of my games, and I did enjoy it. But, um, you know, I did a lot of, like, catch rat side quests, uh, which which is, is genuinely always Just really fun. Just skip the side quests. Um, Just skip I, the side quests. You'll be fine. <laughs> and I, I was genuinely enjoying it. I do mean to play it at some point. Um, but I think I was playing a couple other big games at the time, and I just didn't have time for a long RPG, and so it, it, it got shelved. Um, so eventually I will, I will go back, uh, but I didn't play enough for it to be on my list. Um, so I want to give a, sh- a big shout out to Plague Tale, um, because I think it probably was my favorite mm-hmm, PS Plus mm-hmm. game, but I'm going to cheat a little bit and go with a different game so I get to talk about more games. <laughs> um, but shout out to Plague Tale. Uh, my real answer is obviously Wreckfest. Uh, it was so fun driving those tra- tractors around. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was the best game I've ever played. I bet it was. I bet it was. Uh, no, I, I am giving this to Remnant uh, from the Ashes, mm-hmm. which uh, is super cool. It was that kind of Souls-like game uh, that came out. But what makes Remnant... A really exciting is it is it's the gun one um so it's souls but with guns and that's totally reduct- reductive because it's not at all what it's like but it does have the dodge roll it does have the you know pick up loot and your souls when you die you go back and, and restart the level but what's neat about this one is everything is generated so it's procedurally generated when you go into the dungeons which is really an interesting take it's not a proper roguelike but it does have that kind of randomization and what else is cool is that each time you fight a boss there's like a set number of bosses it can be in that arena and you get one out of random and so as you defeat each boss they give you different loot drops and so depending on what ones you just happen to encounter in what order it really changes what resources you have available to you which is really neat so like you kind of I, I kind of like that because you're strategizing and changing your build up on the fly with what you get. You can't just go into be like, oh, I'm being a strength character. I know I'm using this weapon from the start and like, this is going to be my build. It's kind of like, oh, I'm sort of doing this one thing, but then, oh, hang on. Like now I found all these like fire upgrades. So now I'm going to transition to like a dot fire build and you're, the upgrading is very, really simple. You more upgrade your gear than your stats. So it lets you kind of switch things up really easily which which I like and I think works well with like how unpredictable it is because you can't plan ahead so you have to be able to like be flexible Uh, and so I think that's really neat and then the other thing is um this game is is very like co-op accessible so Mm -hmm. I've played yeah it was interesting I remember you played it mostly single right and I I played it with two friends so it was interesting I started out single and I I was not 100% in love with it Um, but then I started playing with a friend and and we had an absolute blast and kind of going through each of each of our worlds and so seeing like what kind of different stuff we ran into in his game versus running into in my game uh, and how those two things changed and then so you make some cool like story decisions and there's a lot of like fun little secrets to find and I think it's just a really neat world as well Uh, and I think this game it's easy to overlook I think it's kind of visually it doesn't really like show you too much like it's kind of a lot of like desolate gray areas like kind of it looks like a gears of war (laughs) yeah it's kind of (laughs) post-apocalyptic there's a lot of running around in the overworld with like you know broken buildings and and crumbling environments and I, I think that it's a little bit it doesn't really show itself off fantastically in the first hour or two but some of the the fights get really cool there's a lot of neat enemy types there are other areas that are exciting to to go around and explore um there's some some cool yeah, the swampy and, area is pretty cool the swamp area is pretty cool and it doesn't even poison you it's amazing they made a souls game and this poison swamp amazing. <laughs> it doesn't poison you i don't know what's going on it's not a true souls game um 
but yeah, something ain't quite right around here. <laughs> something ain't quite right around here. Um, but yeah, th- this game is is like a like such a big sleeper hit, I think. Um, and I'm so glad I kind of mm. gave it a, a second try. And I got it on PS Plus. They gave it free for Epic. Like, play, people just want you to like play this game. Just play it. <laughs> and uh, I, I I genuinely had a blast with it, and I I intend to play some more. Nice. Good. Uh, this is a good pick. Yeah. So I think that's a. Uh, we're about halfway through the list, um, so we got a few more things here. Uh, we'll get into our, our new category. Um, so this is the best backlog game, and, and this is for the game that was with you all along. Uh, it's a little Bloodborne reference for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, why don't you tell me? I think, uh, yeah, go ahead, Kate, take okay. it away. Okay, I'll take this. Um, so this one's kind of funny. I picked Darkest Dungeon. Uh, I've played a decent amount of Darkest <laughs> Dungeon throughout the years, um, but I'm playing with a friend right now, and, and I think we're genuinely going to, to do the full gambit here and actually beat the game, which is amazing because I've never done that. Uh, and and I think playing co-op has really taken a lot of the negativity out of the game because what I always said is I love the game. I, I I'm so impressed with what they set out to do, but it just kind of feels like shit all the time. Like you just constantly, like, everything's horrible. All your people are stressed. Everyone's dying. It's, it's so oppressive, but playing it together, like we, we've kind of spent more time sort of like role playing and making up stories for our characters and just kind of joking around and, and making it a little bit more of a lighthearted atmosphere, which I think this game really benefits from. And so now we've, we've got just like a whole list of hilarious characters. Like we got a guy named Chauncey and that's just the name he came with. And so we like <laughs> made up a story for Chauncey and like all these stupid guys. We've got like two of the same characters. We had, we had an abomination and like he just got a couple like really good like crits with his vomit attack. So now it's vomit man. And then there's like a second abomination and he doesn't get to vomit because he's not vomit man. And like we've just <laughs> been making up all sorts of like fun fun kind of like stories for these characters and then at the same time just really going through and kind of getting to be a little bit more tactical with, with some of the choices and we even had a single character die like we are doing incredibly well very well very um, well done nice this is an absolute banger of a run and i'm having such a fun time with it and so i'm so glad it was kind of inspired by two um and and wanting to kind of beat the story so that when i did get around to two like I, I think there's a lot of implications for the ending of one being important for two and, and I, it's just such a cool story in the Lovecraft setting is is one of my absolute favorites that I think it's just an absolute crime I never beat this game and so I'm so proud of myself that uh, I'm playing it again I'm gonna beat it um there is also a character in one that's like there's a couple characters that are like named main characters I guess and the other ones are just characters you get uh, and, and one of them shows up in two and the other one does not. <laughs> and I don't oh, I don't totally. know if that's just because it's early access and he's not in the game yet or if it's like, uh oh, uh oh, what happened to him? <laughs> and of course, um, no one will give me spoilers uh, despite my begging for it. But secretly, I don't want to know. Uh, and so uh, I'm very stressed out about it. But um, always bring your torches, always bring enough food. Always remember to use keys on chests uh, to get the good loot. Um, and uh, don't get turned into a vampire in the Crimson Court and uh, eat the blood of your friends. And But other than that, enjoy the Darkest okay. Dungeon. <laughs> that's, some, that's some great advice, great life advice. Um, my favorite backlog game that I played this year, and it's a bit of a weird pick because it's, it's kind of been one of those, like, I, I, I mean... I've always meant to play it, but it's never been like super uh, like on the backlog list for sure. But since uh, Deathloop was coming out earlier this year, I decided that I was going to wait for that ah, on um, yes. Game Pass yes. next, next year. So I decided that my backlog game for this year um, is Dishonored, which I went back and tried out because I hadn't played any arcane games before. And uh, it's always been something I've been told, you know, a lot of people, like a lot of friends that are just like, hey, you should you should check out Dishonored. So, hey, I did. And I loved Dishonored. I think it was such a good game. Um, coming out from 2012, obviously, I'm expecting a little bit of that. You know, it's it's dated. It's nearly a decade old at this point, which is quite shocking and frightening to say. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the setting of the game was just, it's really interesting. It's like a, another plague. Like maybe we have, we have a bit of a plague theme going on this year for the awards. Uh, but with Plague Tale and now like there's a there's kind of a plague going on in this industrial city and in Dishonored and and uh, you know there's not a lot of games that focus around on stealth and I, this game can be played 
you know, with a pretty heavy action focus also, depending how you play your character. But I really, really enjoyed skulking around the city and being all sneaky and using my the blink ability and like teleporting up onto buildings. Yeah. And um, just you know some of the some of the arsenal you get like when you can control the rats and you can you can uh, you know take them over and crawl through little pipes and then all of a sudden you're somewhere else and you can infiltrate buildings through the sewers and yes. and like all those different the, different things you can do the level design in that game is an absolute masterpiece like just all the amount of options you have on, on ways you can tackle them and they're not extremely big but they're very detailed in a very um conscious way and i think that was the thing that always stuck out to me about that game and you mentioned the stealth and i think it does have the action side like you got the stealth skill tree and the action skill tree you choose which one to use but i always thought the game was kind of designed with the intention of like you use stealth first and then if you yeah. accidentally get into trouble then you have some combat capabilities to get yourself out but i think it, it was definitely at least the first game is definitely designed with like the intention of stealth is kind of like the core gameplay yeah, and that's how I played it too, like mm -hmm. exactly how you said. I would try and sneak around as much as I could. If I got found out, like, yeah, I'd, I'd kill people. And you, the thing that the game does is really cool. It's got it's got some rewards of, like, if you manage to actually stealth a level, mm -hmm. you can kind of make some different choices that affect the story. Like, you know, there's, there's a guy who, who's, I think there's like a dictator or something later in the game, and it's like, hey, you can either kill him or you can play this propaganda of the radio to ruin his reputation. And so you have to pick, like, which of these routes are you going to take, and depending which one you pick, it's like well you might need to sneak to a different area of the level or talk to this different npc and or hope they're not dead or something like that and so there's a lot of different um like i don't know if it, how much it really branches but the game is kind of affected by um choices you make and also like how much you kill like towards the end of the game uh, i guess like some different enemy types were showing up for me and maybe the scenarios were a bit different because i'd actually ended up killing like quite a lot of people by the end because my stealth skills weren't always up to <laughs> up to par on some of these levels but i mean i i really thoroughly enjoyed this i think this the skills themselves really link well together like you know teleport behind enemy kill them there um then you get found out but you slow down time and there's just a really nice arsenal like i didn't feel like any one thing really wasn't very useful you know like in a lot of these games with the skill trees i i think of like shadow of war and stuff like that like you you seem to find the two or three things that work really particularly well and then just kind of spec into those and and forget the rest but i i really felt like i used the whole arsenal in dishonored in different mm -hmm. situations and i'm just uh really blown away mostly by like how old the game is um, not that it's like retro or anything but if this game is this good i'm i'm really excited to check out uh and then um, Deathloop later in the year also because, yeah, this game is fantastic and I'm so happy that I finally played it and um, I guess that's what makes it my backlog game of the year. Yeah, that, that is a fantastic pick. I, I love Dishonored when I played it. Um, maybe we'll both have to play two in 2022 and see if we should. it captures we should. the magic. Yeah, perfect. Um, okay, well, we've got three awards left to give out um, and I'm going to go through this one just kind of quick fire, at least for me. It's, it's sure. best new mechanic. Uh, this is the best new or unique use of a mechanic in game. Uh, and I went with the Death Store magic system, which I spoke about at the top mm, of the show, mm -hmm. uh, and just how, how simple but elegant uh, that system was for me. Um, and I just, you know, I wanted Death Store to get a reward or uh, get an award, so <laughs> that worked out double for me. But yeah, I do right. really think that um, a, a best mechanic doesn't have to be something big and flashy. It can be something that's kind of simple, but just, just used in a, in a really creative way that, that fits well for the game and, and I think this is a perfect example of that. Um, it's just kind of a little spin on, on how maybe those stamina or, or like a mana bar typically tends to work. Uh, and I think the blending of the two was was perfect for the game like Dust Door. So uh, that's my quick pick. Um, what do you I like got? it? I like <laughs> it. You know, I was I was expecting Death Door to be like I was like, well, I know you've mentioned it's going to show up. Where is it going to be? Yeah. So interesting that it's <laughs> yeah. there. Um, for me, the best mechanic I I wanted to shout out on my second PS Plus game actually, um, Maquette, and a game I played ah, near the Maquette. start of the year. Yes. Uh, which was yeah. that puzzle game. And I, I think that game is very underrated. I, I don't know what it is. And maybe puzzle games just don't tend to get a lot of hype unless it's portal or something. But Maquette was a very fascinating game. You know, it, it had um this this really unique way you would solve. I don't know, I guess it's kind of similar to that other game, Super, Super Liminal, Liminal, where you're yeah. You're augmenting the size of different objects, but Maquette is really neat. Like you've got a, a diorama of this building in front of you and you'll place like a block on it. But then when you look over to your side, you're actually standing by like a full size version of that building. And because you put the block on the diorama, that block is now full size, but 
beside you and there's like these increasing levels kind of like those russian stacking dolls of like <laughs> yeah. of like changing size and depending like you get in some really crazy things like you're changing the size of objects and then later on your character's actually changing sizes because you're like coming and going in these different areas and it's just it's kind of mind bending but when you get into it and you kind of get into a flow and you and you learn sort of how the game works you get your mind wrapped around it it's a really great experience and, and it has some kind of like um it's got some storytelling in it. Like there, there is like uh, some dialogue that happens and um, also the soundtrack as well. Like I, I feel like I bring up a lot of soundtracks all the time, but this game has like real um, acoustic music in it with like vocalization and stuff. Like it, it's done really well. Um, not overly long. And, and some of the puzzles, admittedly, I did have to look up uh, guides and stuff, but that's the game itself. Like there's built all around this mechanic of like augmenting the size of objects and things. And I just thought it was so unique compared to a lot of other stuff. Um, and I would love to see a sequel or like more games take this on because it's just it's just that interesting level of puzzle design for me, um, which yeah. is better than just like unlocking doors and keys and stuff like the way you have to actually be um, thinking about these things. It's, all, it's almost like you need to get like a whiteboard out and like write down like, <laughs> yeah. your steps because there's just so much you got to do. But I, I really thoroughly enjoyed Maquette and um, it's a, it was a great game earlier this year. That's awesome. I'm excited to play that one. I think you had it for PS Plus and I, I can't remember what I played. Um, yeah. but I, it's, it's actually downloaded on my PS5 and, uh, I've got oh, that nice, and yeah. super liminal sitting together. Um, yeah. so I, I, love I should those check that super of, liminal. I, yeah. Those yeah. perspective puzzle games are, are just so clever. And I always think like as cool as it is to play, like I can't imagine how interesting that is to actually design one of those games. Like the, oh my God, the creativity yeah. that, that goes behind it is, is incredible. And, um, yeah. I, I didn't write this down, but you reminded me that I played dark, which was that other, um, perspective puzzle mm -hmm, game where you're kind mm -hmm. of like flipping like you walk up to the wall and then you like flip perspective and now the wall is the floor and you're walking that way instead and like just changing perspective and, and how well they they created a puzzle game around that um so i, I want to shout mm -hmm, that out as mm -hmm. well because you reminded me um puzzle nice, games are, yeah. are so cool and innovative uh yeah. and they really deserve yeah. more love um but we'll move on to our uh second last category and this is another favorite of mine actually it's best comfort food game it's the perfect game to curl up and relax with and uh what do you got for this one? Yeah, yeah. This was probably the hardest one for me to answer uh, this year for some reason. I don't know why. I guess I felt a lot of comfort in playing a lot of games. Mm -hmm. But uh, I kind of just, I, maybe I'm cheating here a little bit, but I just really wanted to shout out um, a game that I really wanted to give Game of the Year to in a lot of ways, but it didn't. Um, it's yeah. Dodgeball Academia. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this game. It's available, I believe, on everything. And I, and I think that if you have any kind of nostalgia for, um, like, Pokemon, I guess you'd say, or like, uh, I just, or like even Saturday morning cartoons being like a kid in like the late 90s, early 2000s, this game really just has one of those feels like, you know, um, like everything revolves around dodgeball. It's like in Yu-Gi-Oh, like you, you duel for no matter what the conflict is, you're going right. to duel to see who wins. Like in this game, you're going to play some damn dodgeball and you're going to like, you're, you're just going to get your team together and you're going to enter dodgeball tournaments and that's all it is. But it was just, it was something about the game instantly felt, had me feeling that nostalgic feeling, even though it's a brand new thing. Um, you know, like, I don't know if it was the graphic style or the way that as you walked through the school community, um, you made eye contact with the other students and they, they wanted to fight you. That's like very Pokemon-esque right, Pokemon. as like running past the people. And so uh, the game itself just really felt really familiar right from the start. And then it, it, you add on to that with, you know, it's, it's, it's an RPG. There's some light mechanics and you're kind of giving equipment to your characters and building out a party. And uh, at the same time, you're getting better at dodgeball and learning some new moves and, and how the different mechanics work when they introduce like oh now there's ice dodgeball and stuff like that and so it, it just was a great game from start to finish i played it i think at a nice pace where i didn't completely just give up my life and do nothing but play dodgeball academia but there was a nice stretch of like two weeks when i was playing it where i was excited to sit down for that hour at the end of my day and really mm -hmm. just you know yeah it's like get a nice cup of tea or something and, and play dodgeball for an hour like that was that was really really nice and thinking back i went through my whole list i, I think i beat 32 games this year Impressive. and out of all of them I feel like for the ones that didn't uh, fit any of the other awards, I just dodgeball academia just called out to me. And so for maybe that for that reason, it's uh, it's my comfort food game for this year. <laughs> I think that's a perfect pick. I, I remember you being so excited to tell me about dodgeball academia earlier in the year, and like yeah, it came just, out of nowhere. I'd, yeah, just such a weird sleeper pick, but uh, it did genuinely. Yeah, it's a great really game. Cute. It's and it's a Brazilian game too. I think there's been a couple pretty big games coming out of Brazil this year. 
Um, I forget the name of the studio, so I'm so sorry, but I'm very excited to see um, okay. what they make next because it was phenomenal. Well, you can look that up and I'll, I'll tell you about my comfort food. And, and this is a funny pick. I, I gave a little like a, a little Josh into Halo um, earlier about being a funny comfort food. Um, but looking at my game, I have absolutely no right to say that uh, because <laughs> I started a second playthrough, or not second, I started another uh, playthrough of Bloodborne a couple weeks ago, and technically <laughs> that means I played Bloodborne in 2021, and that means I can put my favorite game of all time on a list, <laughs> and it's going here, and it sounds weird, uh, Bloodborne is a very stressful game, I often feel like I need heart medication uh, when I'm playing it to get my <laughs> blood pressure under control. Um, because even still to this day, when I fight a boss, I've beaten, you know, a few times, uh, my heart just goes like absolutely crazy, but it, it is comforting in the sense of that it's a game I'm so familiar with at this point, And I have spent so much time in not just playing, but also like watching the hours and hours of lore video and uh, videos and talking with the community about all these, these little like fan theories and things. And it's just a game I feel so intimately connected with. Um, so it's kind of funny now I'm going through, especially the earlier levels where it's like, oh, I know, I know that guy's going to kind of jump out from behind yeah, the this corner guy's gonna come out. and it's, it's a jump scare and it's like, well, I, I'm ready for you, you loser. And like, you're going through those, <laughs> through those earlier areas that I remember dying so many times on my first, first playthrough that were so difficult. And now it's like, it's nothing. Right. And I mean, obviously like you can still die. You got to be on your toes. Like Bloodborne will never be an easy game, but it's a lot different perspective when you're, you're very familiar with it and doing an, a new run. Um, and so it's kind of just been my relaxing, like, oh, I just want to play some Bloodborne and like be in that world and run around and, and kind of not take it too, too seriously. And then I've also got, um, I, I'm, a, I'm trying to do good in the world. You know, I, I think it's a really good thing to be a positive influence in other people's lives and just kind of spread joy and cheer. And, and so I've managed to get two people who have never played to start Bloodborne within the last couple of weeks. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, and, you know, I'm doing my good in the world and both of them first time, totally blind, don't know anything. And I've been watching. And so it's been so fun to just kind of sit back, relax and just see how other people experience it for the first time and kind of get that like vicarious like live through like I know it's coming up mm -hmm, next and they mm -hmm. have no idea and so like you know to see the cleric yeah, beast jump yeah. down for the first time and and all that exciting stuff and you know they get up to the mob at the start and like holy god there's a lot of guys and I'm like yeah welcome to Yarnum and like we know we've met Gilbert <laughs> and uh you know we've met Eileen yep, and it's just good. been an absolute like blast for me so bloodborne is kind of my cozy not just playing for myself but also like i got a couple hours in the evening i'm tired like yeah i'll watch you play some bloodborne and uh, that'll relax for me so you said it was the year of plagues and uh what is yeah, the king of play theme. games uh king of play games is and always will be bloodborne <laughs> a good answer honestly yeah i mean going back and revisiting some of your favorite stuff is always is always such a treat you know whether mm -hmm. no matter what kind of game I feel like that's that's always a great answer for comfort food. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that brings us to our game of the year, right? It does. This is indeed. the last category. This is oh this is gosh. the big so one. Exciting. I'm excited, Kate. Lay it on me. What's your game of the year? Okay. Well, I have to give a quick shout out first because I finished Sekiro this year. But I played it very early on in the year, and I will say that Sekiro, and I think I said it before when we talked about our, uh, we did that list of our the best games of all time, mm -hmm, our favorite mm -hmm, top 25 yeah. list, and I argued a lot for this one. I think Sekiro definitively, Bloodborne is the biggest game in my heart, but definitively Sekiro is my favorite game of all time. Um, I don't know mm. if that, maybe Elden Ring will change that, who knows, but Sekiro is always number one in my mind. But uh, because I kind of started it, I think in... 2020 or I started it and then kind of finished it in 2021 and so it it, it kind of was only like a small portion a of my year it was kind of split I don't think I define 2021 by Sekiro um even though it is it is my top game um but when I think about it really the, the big game that stuck out to me this year it's got to be Returnal uh to nobody's mm -hmm. surprise mm -hmm. uh that's got to be here and I've spoken about it a lot on the show uh so I won't go into too too much detail here but Returnal was a game that absolutely surprised me. It could be in half of these categories easily. Um, but I, I picked this one up kind of on a whim. Um, our buddy Josh from The Loud Thumbs was uh, going off about how great this game was. And he mentioned something about a really good dodge roll. And uh, he just kind of <laughs> <laughs> he just kind of got my brain thinking like, hang on, this could be really neat. I'm not 
it, it's not the kind of thing I'd normally pick. It's very sci-fi. It's very like it's a shooter. Um, it, it's not normally what I would what I would go for, but I picked up Returnal. It just ticked all these boxes for me. It, it's got some bullet hell aspects. It's got an amazing like kind of souls like the dodge is fantastic. Um, it, it's roguelike where you're, you're kind of constantly getting upgrades and, and getting new access to guns and the levels are amazing. Like the amount of environmental detail and storytelling in this game is phenomenal. Like I was so hooked on trying to figure out what the hell was going on, like what kind of planet she'd gotten into, like what's happening with this cycle where you keep being reborn into crashing on this planet over and over and over again mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. what that's doing to the main character's psyche and then it, it brings up all these things from her past and how those are, are relevant and it just kind of culminates in this amazing fragmented way of storytelling that absolutely blew me away and on top of that the gameplay is is phenomenal like this is is um housemark's first big triple a game and I, I think sony even bought them after this they're like yeah that, that was fucking good please do yeah, more of this yeah. <laughs> uh, and right. for good reason um but it was just one of those games where it comes along and i i find especially even as i get older and i play more and more games and, and why i always kind of gravitate towards from soft and, and bloodborne was such a big game for me at the time is i find that i i kind of get tired of of games from time to time and i think i end up do you know I enjoy them and they're fun but they they don't hit me in a way of like the same way you play games when you're a kid and like this is the coolest thing I've ever right, seen yeah. and like you know you're blown away and there, there's kind of a little bit of fatigue that comes along with so many games just being so similar and that's not to say that they're bad games but they just they kind of feel a little familiar in a lot of ways and Returnal came along and just everything I thought I was going to happen in the game and every direction I thought it was going to take and every gun I got every boss I fought was just so surprising and I constantly like was on the edge of my seat all game because I didn't know it was going to happen I'd never played anything quite like Returnal and you know doing some research afterwards I don't think there is anything quite like Returnal like bullet hells are usually like 2d like side scrollers or or like they're top down and and you know they always go in that kind of format but this is like a fully 3d like world you've got to be dodging around and enemies might be behind you they're all over the place like it, it's it's very overwhelming to begin with but it has that action game where it slowly just starts to get slower and slower as you play and then now you're seeing all the information you see instead of just being overwhelmed and i i cannot tout this game enough if demon souls is the reason i bought my ps5 returnal is the reason to own a ps5 and damn it, what a it, <laughs> it's a big game and uh, i know it showed up at, at uh you know jeff's game awards tm um <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. our good friend jeff um and i think it only won one award and i think it's a shame this wasn't up for for game of the year because i i think it is yeah. such an innovative strong contender and it, it's a crime that not as many people have played it i know it's kind of niche and i know it's kind of weird but if you've ever had even like a slight interest in what Returnal could be uh or you're into Lovecraft or if you're into like Souls games or like Bullet Hells just play Returnal like it will steal your whole life and you will be absolutely in love with it <laughs> I think that's a great pick and mm -hmm. and yeah I'm surprised it wasn't in game of the year too and I, I think mm -hmm. that there's like this idea that this year hasn't had a lot of great games but honestly it's like I think I think there's been a lot of great games. It's just that there's a lot of great games that appeal to different people. And so there's yeah. not like that one standout type of thing. That's a great pick though. And I, and you know, as much as I need to play uh, death's door, as we said earlier, I really need to, to get on Returnal mm -hmm. and check that one out. Oh my God. So much to play, Kate, so much to play. <laughs> uh, great pick. Okay. My game of the year, my turn. Um, Okay, so I just want to shout out first two smaller games. Um, Artful Escape is something I played earlier this, or actually quite recently. Um, I really, really, really love that game. It might be one of my favorite stories ever in a video game. I mentioned how it reminds me of one of my favorite books, The Alchemist, and, and kind of like finding your own um, personal journey and like what you want to find in your life. And I, I really like that. But the game, the gameplay itself just is very... Um, you know, very basic, very minimal. And I, I just couldn't quite award it to that, even though I love the story and the message. And the other one, um, Inscription, is another small game, which I recently started. Um, I've, I've, I've just not played it enough to name it Game of the Year. That's just ridiculous. But I, I think this game seems very special so far. And I, I cannot wait to finish that and talk about it later on the show. Hopefully, once you've played it, too, and we yes, can, we can chat about that. Yes, I know. I know. You bugged me to play it. <laughs> I think that was the but, game. You're uh, like, yeah. I won't tell you anything because I won't spoil it, but it's a Katie game, so go get it. And uh, I am yeah, so yeah. excited. <laughs> 
It's fantastic. Um, but really, like the, the biggest shout out I want to give uh, which, a game that didn't win my game of the year is Ratchet and Clank, uh, mm-hmm. especially since we are a PlayStation podcast. I, I was I loved Ratchet and Clank earlier th- this year. Um, I think it was, you know, a perfect distillation of that franchise. I think that they they added a lot that obviously showed off the PS5. You know, it was mm-hmm. a great game. But at the end of the day, I, I just think that it was very it was more similar to the previous Ratchet and Clank games than my game of the year, which is Metroid Dread, ah, was Metroid to Dread. The, its previous iteration. That was that was my second uh, guess for you. I you thought know, I, I thought Bug Snacks, but then I thought if it's not Bug Snacks, it's gonna be <laughs> Metroid Dread. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Bug Snacks. Yeah, yeah. I, this one really came down to the wire between Ratchet and Metroid for me. It, mm-hmm. it, it changed a couple times, but at the end of the day, something's just yelling at me. You know, you got to pick Metroid. Yep. Um, I think for a couple reasons. Number one is like, it's just been so long since we've had a Metroid game. And I know it's been a while for Ratchet and Clank too, but I mean, Metroid Fusion came out in like 2003. So that's been a long time. Um, so, I mean, Dread was just fantastic. And we're going back now. We we mentioned the plague. Now we're on to sci-fi. And so you had Returnal, um, <laughs> yep. Metroid, same thing. Like, I, I love the world they put together for this game. Every area has just has such a unique kind of vibe to it. Um, I mean, some of them could be... I guess you could say better than others, but I love the different varieties, the way the enemies all have their different, um, you know, different things you run into in different environments. I love how just those that Metroidvania style of, like... I think the game has a fantastic map system. I love the way that um, you you always feel like you know where you can go to explore when you find, you know, oh, this this door here. I need to remember that when I get, you know, a new missile or an upgrade, this is here. But you always have an idea also at the same time of where you need to go, that whether it's the map itself showing you or whether it's some kind of environmental clue of, like, something that's leading you in the right direction. You just always seem to know where you need to go next. And exploration's an option if you choose. Yeah, I agree. I, I've started playing it recently and I'm not too, too far, um, but I had the exact same thing. The map looks huge and overwhelming and uh, it, it's a pretty big game, but it's always, you get, you seem to get power-ups exactly when you need them. And then you seem to kind of get, you know, you'll, you'll go into a little subsection where you get the power-up and then it'll kind of like pop you back into the main area right where you need to use it. And so there's a really nice flow of, of getting stuff and, and there's mm-hmm. that kind of like, oh, I don't really know, you always seem to get something right when you're kind of running out of places to go that then opens up the next area for you. And it's just, it kind of seems to perfectly work in that like sequence. And, and there's definitely, I'm sure, a lot of like, you know, places you can go back and, and use these other upgrades. And like, there's definitely the optional exploration areas, but I, I think it does that perfect uh, balance, at least early on, of being that like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of starting to, to feel like I'm maybe getting a little bit lost and like, oh God, here I go this way. And then like, oh, it opened up stuff. And then like, okay, now I'm feeling lost again. And then it repeats. So uh, I think it's, <laughs> yeah. I think it's very carefully crafted with that in mind. And, and it's awesome because it's easy to, to feel like you're just finding everything yourself and you're just so smart and clever. But I, I think yeah, the game is right. secretly doing a lot of heavy lifting for you. <laughs> I think it is too. And, and by yeah. no means is it like, you know, very difficult to find some of these things. There is a lot of hidden stuff and there are some very difficult challenges in the game, but it does such a good job, like you say, of drip feeding you. Like just when mm-hmm. you're about to need that next dopamine, hit, it's, it's like, oh, I found a new gun upgrade or I found a new yeah. suit or something. Like you're always getting something new. And, you know, th- there's a lot of really fun boss fights in the game as well i know so there's some contention on like if they're too difficult and some of them are are quite challenging but for me it was like it was fun to learn those kind of puzzles i don't know if it's um the the style of game like for me i I like the 2d kind of style like for me it's fun to learn like the those type of patterns and whatnot Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff too like later on when you beat the game you could look up there's actually a way to like instantly kill one of the bosses if you've found a certain item first if you sort of went off the path and you and you have something else you can actually just pretty much skip one of the bosses there's a lot of cool stuff like that and like sequence breaking and whatnot in in metroid always but and and the the thing that makes this game just stand out so much and uh, one of the reasons that i had it so tied so contentiously with ratchet is because i think both games are just they just feel so slick the the controls just couldn't be better you know samus moves around she moves on a dime the the jump in metroid i think has this perfect level of floatiness to where you have the height for a lot of what you need but it's not like a like a really crazy kind of floaty jump um little details in the lighting especially in the save rooms when you walk into those for the first time and the lights on her suit are kind of reflecting off the floor and it just looks really nice 
Uh, I think, I mean, the game, like the controls and the visuals are just so snappy and, and you need that level of precision for a lot of the challenges that the game asks of you later on. Um, and then the the final thing is just, I think the Emmys are such a great addition to Metroid. You know, they break up the um, the traditional kind of exploration areas with these self-contained sort of Emmy rooms and you're sort of figuring out these stealth puzzles and how you're going to get around. And, um, you know, they're, they're just nice little palate cleansers. And you know, again, when you defeat the Emmys, they're going to leave you an item that you're going to really need to get through the game. And so it's it's just this, yeah, constant dopamine hits of new new items, new exploration, like uncovering new map, beating bosses, and then wrapped all up in a nice Metroid package, which has been something we've been waiting for for a long time. It's it's just a great game. And, and I think it also fulfills, like, the game of the year. Like, people will remember 2021 for the year Metroid came back. Mm -hmm. And I think that's... A, important aspect of what game of the year means at least for me is it's like it's not just the game it's also like does it kind of represent the year in like that um the context of, of the industry and i think metroid is a, is a franchise that does that yeah that is, that is a solid pick i, I think if i had played i mean i don't think uh, metroid Dread would have top returnal for me just in terms of mm -hmm, my own mm -hmm. gaming preferences uh, i tend to like the more like 3D games with more um, exploration and kind yeah. of just the story in Returnal was really big for me as well. Uh, I love that kind of fragmented storytelling where I'm, I'm kind of putting the pieces together myself. Um, but I mm -hmm. genuinely think that if I'd played more Metroid Dread, it would have been in contention for for at least one of the awards on this list. Um, and that's from someone yeah, who's yeah. not a big Metroid person. Like we we had the like NES like OG Metroid, and I remember <laughs> that we, game is so tough, man. We used oh to my play God. it occasionally, and like we never got past the first area because it was so hard, and we had no idea where to go. I don't think we ever fought a boss. As no kids. I don't I really think... <laughs> don't think we ever made it to a boss. I think you're right. I don't think we ever fought a single boss in that game. Um, so <laughs> my my history with Metroid is is not like it's playing on nostalgia nostalgia or anything um but i'm i'm yeah. really impressed with dread so far and i think it's it, it could kickstart me into like maybe metroid prime 4 eventually exists and and i might be more inclined to check it out now after having played some dread yeah but, right yeah you know. some great picks overall though kate you know i think uh honestly like they they all fit what we're kind of trying to cover with these awards i like our award show in general i think it covers some some stuff that a lot of other ones don't you know like who goes into a specific mechanic or like the backlog games you know mm -hmm. like, i really like that about the show and then at the same time we're honoring um you know some older stuff some newer stuff it's it's just a good yeah. time to put this together and you know what it's always really fun to look back a year in review and, and you always remember those those games come to mind really quickly of like what you've played in the, the second half of the year but i always think it's really fun to be like you know what did i play in the first half like oh my god yeah i forgot about that like that was a great game and and so it's just kind of fun to kind of wrap the year up i think and uh, yeah, this is this is an absolute blast. Yeah, I'm trying I love... to remember too, like how you felt about them. Yeah, exactly, and and it's just kind of fun too to quantify like where does Maquette fall in line with Metroid Dread, right? And like how do you how do you pick one over the other? It's kind of tough. Um, but yeah, it's always a blast to do a year in review. I think next year for sure we've got to add in uh, best soundtrack because you brought that up with a couple games, and uh, the soundtrack is often a highlight uh, for me. I didn't talk about it uh, so much today, but at least half the games on my list, the soundtrack is a is a big reason of of what I what I love most about it and, and getting into the immersion and oh my god um if you do the uh Ludwig fight in Bloodborne listen to that song it's the best um but anyway yeah uh tips for next year and and thanks everyone to sending in some fantastic lists of your own they were a joy to read and if anyone still wants to send them in like there's no it's never too late like send us your list now send us your list in two weeks send us your list next July like I don't care <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, you can. Who says game of the year awards have to be cut off in December? That's just nonsense. You know, you can send it whenever you want. Um, <laughs> but in all serious note, thank you everyone for listening. Uh, it's been uh, hopefully as much fun for you to hear our lists as it has been for us to uh, go through the games we played this year. Um, again, if you want to get in touch, all our links are below. But you can find us at Circles and Squares Pod, or no, at CNS Pod on Twitter and Circles and Squares Pod at Gmail dot com uh, to get any submissions into us. Um, if you want to give us a Christmas gift as well, we're always appreciating of Apple uh, podcast reviews or, you know, any of that good stuff, wherever you like to listen. We always love to see uh, those type of things from you guys. So, again, thank you all very much. And we will see everyone again on January 3rd for our first show of the new year. Um, again, either a new show or an extra show, depending uh, what happens. And then uh, a week after that on, I believe, it, I guess it would be the 10th, will be our uh, next episode of this show, the Circles and Squares podcast. And it will be our 2022 video game predictions for the year so another good show coming up um, look forward to that and we'll see you all on the next show